This interface not only looks cool with all the colorful buttons, but also features 8 analog ins as well as 8 analog outputs, offers a vintage mode, a built-in compressor, has DC coupled outputs, is extendable with additional digital connections and can be used in a rack or on your desk. Let's have a closer look. Hey, Julian Krauss here and with me I got the Universal Audio 876 USB audio interface, which as of today is the largest interface in the Volta lineup. The interface is aimed at people looking for a studio centerpiece or really everybody who needs a larger amount of I.O. Full disclosure, Universal Audio sent me the interface for evaluation, but all measurements and my opinion in this video are my own and Universal Audio has no say in the making of this video. All right, let's check out the hardware before we dive deeper into the audio quality and software. On the front of the Volt 876, you get two mic line slash instrument inputs in the form of XLR and TRS combo connectors. Additional inputs will be on the rear, which I will show you in a second. Further to the right, you get multiple control options, like for example an encoder knob to set the gain for the eight inputs. And you can do that by selecting the input with the corresponding button and then using the knob to change the gain. On that note, nearly all controls of the 876 can be accessed and changed via the software as well. This means that you can adjust the gain from the PC and pretend to your friends that you can adjust it with a force. Pretty neat. But let's stick with the hardware for now. You also get dedicated buttons that allow you to activate vintage mode and different compressor settings. More about these modes later. And you can also face invert a channel, switch the front inputs to instrument inputs and toggle 48 volt phantom power separately for each channel. In the middle you can find LED level meters, which in my opinion could be a bit more granular, but they do give you a good overview of all your levels. There are also buttons to quickly change the clock source and sample rate. You can also choose between the USB and ADAT operating mode and whether you want to see your input or output levels. There are even more colorful buttons to do things like mute or dim your outputs, use talkback, toggle direct monitoring and switch between your main monitors and a second set of studio monitors. One thing to note here is that the volume dial only affects the main output and the alternative speaker outputs if this is set up. The other outputs bypass the volume control and always play back at full level directly from your DAW. On the far right you can find two headphone outputs with dedicated volume controls. These outputs can also have independent mixes which is great to see. What is not so great is that for some reason Universal Audio has chosen to make the headphone output volume analog control only. This means that even though you can essentially control all features of the 876 via software, even the main output volume, the headphone volume is the only thing that cannot be controlled this way. You will have to reach for the dial on the interface and because the volume controls are so close together, I found adjusting the volume a bit annoying. Bit of a head scratcher for me why the headphone volume is not digitally controlled. Now if you know me, you know that I have a soft spot for good power buttons on audio interfaces and the Volt 876 definitely delivers in that aspect. This is a very tactile button and the illumination is just the icing on the cake. Switching to the back, you can find the additional 6 XLR and TRS combo inputs, totaling up the number to 8 analog inputs. Besides that, you can find 8 TRS line level outputs. As mentioned, the first two channels are for your monitors, channel 3 and 4 can optionally be set as a second pair of monitors, and the rest are your line level outputs. The Volt 876 also features BNC connections for not only word clock out, but also word clock in. This allows you to use the 876 as a master or accept incoming clock signals to sync with other devices. There are also two sets of Toslink connections to extend the interface's inputs by 16 with a sample rate up to 48 kHz or up to 4 with 192 kHz. This is pretty common with other interfaces and an ADAT limitation. The same goes for the outputs. Here you will have up to 16 additional digital outputs depending on the sample rate. The Volt 876 also offers a set of MIDI in and outputs which is not that common and might be one of the bigger deciding factors. Then you obviously get your USB-C connection to connect the interface to your PC and there's also a direct power connection. The power supply sits inside the Volt 876 and that means no power bricks dangling around. Speaking of internals, the boards look pretty nice, which says exactly nothing about the performance. But what should give us a hint is the usage of the converter chips. Interestingly, the Volt 876 uses a Cirrus Logic CS5308P for analog to digital conversion and a CS4308P for main outputs and a separate 4304P for the headphones digital to analog conversion. As far as I can remember, I've not yet seen these chips in any other interface I've reviewed, but according to the spec sheets, they are excellent performing chips, so we shall see how this translates into real-world performance. 
So let's start with the microphone inputs first. Here you can see the frequency response of the microphone input at the maximum gain setting and this is essentially a worst case scenario. Here we can see a very flat frequency response in the audible range. This means that all frequencies are recorded equally well and that's exactly what we want to see. This improves even further with lesser gain settings. But I think even at the maximum setting it was already excellent and now we have essentially a perfect performance. Jumping towards the distortion measurement you can see a descending line which once again is exactly what we want to see. This just means that in this measurement here there is no distortion visible. Otherwise the line would level out or rise up. Dynamic range is the ratio of the strongest signal that an interface can record in its noise floor. This is important when recording more dynamic sources like drums with condenser microphones. You want the dynamic range to be as high as possible to get the least amount of noise in your recordings. Here the Volt 876 comes in with 116 dBA which sits firmly in the excellent category. That's a very competitive performance and in my opinion this is already much more than you will ever need. Of course we can't talk about the microphone input performance without also checking out the preamp noise. This is especially important if you use dynamic microphones as they rely on clean preamp amplification. To give you an audio example I'm currently speaking into an SM7B directly connected to the Volt 876. This mic is infamous for its low output level and this brings out the noise of the preamp and is a perfect stress test. Have a listen to the noise of this setup. That's pretty low noise and in my measurement you can see that the Volt 876 comes in with an EIN of minus 128 dBU. You will notice that some interfaces slightly outperform the Volt 876 in preamp noise performance and I think this has to do with the digitally controlled preamps of the 876. Then again the difference is just 2 to 3 dB which in many situations is not even noticeable. The preamp performance of the 876 is great and I also don't think that you do need a cloud fed header or any other inline preamp with this interface. Maybe you can eke out two more decibels in noise performance but in the overwhelming majority of cases there is just no need for that. Especially because the gain of the interface is also pretty good. Okay let's also have a quick look at the line inputs. I will just quickly show you the measurements here and because unsurprisingly they are very similar to the mic inputs. Frequency response is as good as it gets. As you can see it's a flat line across the chart, nothing more to mention here. In terms of distortion we can see that the line just ever so slightly starts to level out at the bottom right indicating some distortion being detected. That said, this sits way below minus 100 decibels and is completely inaudible for all intents and purposes. Don't worry about it, this is a stellar performance. And we should also not forget a dynamic range here. The Volt 876 once again comes in with 116 dBA, which again sits firmly in the excellent category. Not much more to add, I think this speaks for itself. The line level inputs are really really good. Now you might ask yourself the question, how does the vintage mode and the 76 comp affect the sound of the mic and line inputs? And that's exactly what we can see here. The vintage mode does essentially two things. First of all, it slightly changes the frequency response, giving you a 2 decibel high frequency boost, which overall slightly increases the treble of the recorded audio. And you might have already heard this because I just turned it on. In addition it introduces some slight saturation which you can see in this graph here. Starting at around minus 18 dBFS there is an increase in distortion level so if you push your recording level into that range the vintage mode will start to add some grittiness for the lack of a better word. Some more audio samples and a direct comparison can be found in the video which I will link in the description. Additionally you have the 76 comp which as the name implies is a compressor. It has three different settings, fast, GTR and VOC, which GTR obviously stands for guitar and VOC stands for vocal. Of course the naming is just a suggestion, you can use these settings on anything you like. As you can see in this graph here, all the modes have a makeup gain of about 7 decibels, which makes the audio noticeably louder when turning on the compressor. You can also see at the very top that the compression sets in. It's a nice and gentle curve with a threshold of around minus 10 dBFS. The difference between the fast GTR and VOC modes are in the attack and release times. While GTR and VOC modes have similar attacks, the mode differ in the way how they handle release and GTR is a bit snappier. Generally I would say use the fast comp when you want a very responsive compressor, 
the GTR setting when you want a more gentle compression and VOC if you want an even slower leveling compressor. If you want more details on the compressor, attacks and release times, I will link my previous video of the 276 in the description, which has the exact same compressor built in. While you're scrolling down to the description, please hit the like button and subscribe, this really helps me out. Now keep in mind that the vintage and compressor modes are destructive, meaning they are baked into the recorded audio. So there's no way to undo them in post in case you decide to go a different route. You have been warned. On the plus side, the vintage and compression modes can give you the option to already have some processing applied to the recorded audio. And if you like the sound of the vintage and compression modes on the 876, this can potentially decrease the time you spend in post. Okay, let's jump to the output side because you probably not only want to record audio with your interface, but also listen to it. And here I have some good news. As you can see, the main output and line level output frequency response is once again ruler flat in the audible range, which is exactly what we want to see. Adding to that, the response is actually flat all the way down to DC, which means that the line level outputs can even send DC signals to control voltage devices like synthesizers. Pretty cool to see this feature here. The dynamic range of the output is 118.4 dBA, which is slightly lower than some top performing interfaces that I've tested, but still sits firmly in the excellent category. This is way more dynamic range than you would ever need and the possibility of hearing any noise from the main outputs is virtually zero. Jumping to the distortion measurement, you can see a big warning label here, and that's because the measurement of the output of the 876 is actually limited by my audio analyzer. This just goes to show that the outputs of the Volt 876 outperform my analyzer and distortions are negligibly low. I know it's probably the third video that I say that I have to find a better way of showing these numbers, it's a colorful mess, but at least all the data is here. Focusing on the Volt 876, we can see a mostly green picture, and there are many good things to say about the headphone outputs. First of all, the power output is really good and that means that regardless of which impedance headphones you use, the 876 is likely able to drive them to loud listening levels. Distortion levels are also low enough to be inaudible in my opinion and that's with low and high impedance headphones. Noise is also super low, I doubt that you will ever hear any noise from these headphone outputs. And crosstalk is good as well, giving you a nice stereo separation. Sadly, there are two areas where the headphone outputs of the Volt 876 do not perform as well. This is output impedance and channel balance. While the frequency response is flat, the high output impedance can start to negatively impact the response of low frequency headphones, leading to a colored sound. That's obviously not what you want when monitoring audio. Because the volume of the headphone output is controlled with an analog dial and you have it set at a very low volume level, the right and left side of the headphones might not be the same loudness. You can see this in the graph here. With higher volume settings it's totally fine, but in the lowest 5% range the left and right will have a slightly noticeable different volume. Luckily I have a solution for you and that's to simply use higher impedance headphones with the Volt 876. Headphones with 150 ohms and above avoid the issue with audio coloration from the higher output impedance and because they often are less sensitive, they will need a higher volume setting and this also eliminates the channel imbalance. I do expect most people to use higher impedance headphones with the Volt 876, so it's not the end of the world, but it's not so great that the high output impedance and slight channel imbalance force you to use these kinds of headphones to get accurate sound. Still, overall, I think it's a decent performance of the headphone output and with higher impedance headphones, I would argue it's excellent. All right, of course, we will have a look at the software as this is one of the ways to manage your interface. But before we dive in deeper, I have to mention a big drawback here. For accessing UA Connect, you are forced to create a free account at Universal Audio. Sadly, the ASIO driver, which you need on Windows for low latency audio, is also part of UA Connect. I understand why UA is doing this, as this gives you a central software to manage your audio interfaces updates and plugins. But this also means that the PC you want to install the software on has to have an internet access, and if UA were ever to go out of business, it might even be impossible to get ASIO up and running again on a new PC, as you won't be able to sign in with your account anymore. That's why I really don't like the forced registration here, and I think the ASIO driver should be available as a separate download without the need to create and sign up with an account. But enough of that, let's check out the software. This is the UAD console for the Volt 876, and for the analog inputs you will find all the controls in the software that you can also find are directly on the interface. So you can control things like the gain, vintage mode, compressor, phase inversion and phantom power setting all from the software. You can also link together two channels for stereo recording and also rename channels for a better overview. 
For all the channels, you also get two Q mixes, which can be used to create separate direct monitoring mixes for your headphones. But of course, if you want to, you can also listen to the main mix with the headphones if you like. The main mix is controlled by the sliders here, and here you can also get a good overview of your levels. You also get a loopback channel, which routes the audio of your output back into the UAD console, and you get further controls for turning on and off ADAT channels, toggle between main and alternative studio monitors, and things like mono, mute, and volume control. One thing I noticed is that you only get to see the main output level meter, but not a separate meter for your headphones. That's not the end of the world, but something to keep in mind. In the settings tab, you get some further controls over operating mode, sample rate, digital in and output protocol, and clock source. I quickly want to highlight here that there's an ADAT standalone mode, which when you set, can be used even without a PC connected, and then the Volt 876 acts as a standalone ADAT preamp, sending all eight analog inputs to the corresponding eight digital outputs. You can also couple multiple 876s together, and if you're interested in that, I highly recommend to have a look at the manual. There's a good overview of all the configurations. Last but not least, with the UAD console, you get the option to save your current session. And the cool thing is that many things like input gain, channel mute state, and stereo linking will be saved. This makes it really easy to recall specific recording setups to quickly get up and running. Before giving you my verdict on the interface, let's quickly check out the round triple latency, which is especially important as there are no internal software effects on the Volt 876. This means that, for example, for an amp sim, the audio needs to be routed through the PC, which creates some amount of latency. But I have good news. Generally speaking, the latencies are really low, but I was especially surprised by how low you can get them when disabling safe mode. On many interfaces, you usually gain about a millisecond, but here you actually gain two, and this brings the latency levels down to levels which I've only really seen with RME interfaces. Obviously, without the safe mode, there's an increased risk of crackling audio, but at least you're not limited to high latencies out of the box. With higher sample rates, the same thing here. These are excellent round trip latencies. All right, let's wrap this up. On the plus side, I naturally have to mention the excellent audio quality. Maybe the output impedance of the headphone amp could have been a bit lower, but if you use high impedance headphones, this doesn't really matter much. All other IOs have an excellent amount of dynamic range and inaudible amounts of distortion, which enable clean recordings and high quality audio playback. With the Volt 876, you also get a good amount of extendability via SPDIF and ADAT. I personally like that the majority of controls, like microphone gain, can be controlled via the software without the need to reach for the interface. That's why it's also a bit unfortunate that the headphone volume control is the only thing that can only be controlled via the knobs on the interface, and sadly they are a bit cramped, which was bugging me a bit when changing the headphone volume. The standalone mode of the 876 is also quite handy, as this essentially transforms it into a separate mic preamp if needed. The DC coupled outputs are also very handy for people who use control voltage devices in their workflow. You also get MIDI connections, which is not always the case on these larger interfaces. The build quality is excellent and all of that comes in a rec mountable form factor. Things to consider are that there are no internally processed software effects, like you can for example find on Universal Audio's Apollo line or with the Moto Ultralight Mark V. The Volt 876 also does not have any insert connections, so you can't directly insert outboard audio gear into your signal chain, like you can for example do with the Audient ID48 or Solid State Logic SSL18. I personally also don't like that for Windows the ASIO driver is bundled with the UI Connect software, and you are forced to create an account in order to access UI Connect. Besides that, I have to say the Volt 876 is definitely a worthy addition to the Volt interface lineup, and the great audio quality and aforementioned features make it a strong contender for anyone looking for a studio centerpiece or just generally a larger interface with more I.O. Okay, that's it for now. Please like and subscribe, and we'll see you all in the next one.